when I was in seminary, I was told that George Whitfield, the great evangelist, could preach to 10 to 15,000 people. He did not use a microphone. They didn't have those invented in those days. But we're not, if we have problems, we'll turn this off and off. Do my best. Did you bring your Bible with you today? If you brought your Bible, I just want you to hold it up. Okay? Anytime you come to the house of worship for a worship service, you need to bring your Bible. All right? Well, just let that be a regular. All right? I brought my Bible, but I'm going to use the um, tablet. I've got the scripture on the tablet. So I hope that you'll follow along with me. Before, I'm going to ask you to stand in just a moment. Don't do it yet. But I want to tell you why. I want to tell you why we so often ask you to stand. And the reason for that is this book that you're holding in your hand, whether it be a printed version on your phone, it doesn't matter. The Bible is God's word to man. Think about that. What an incredible gift God has given us in the gift of his word. Now, the Bible, or Jesus is the living word. The Bible is also living. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. We need to bring the Bible with us. We need to read it. We need to follow what it says. Um, you know, if you go to college, let's say. Maybe you major, major in science. Or maybe you have to take a, a class in mathematics. I was a history major in college. Some people study literature. All of those things are great. But none of those things will teach us the message of God's Word. None of those things will tell us about our God. That's why I encourage you every time to bring your Bible with you when you come to church. Also, that's why we stand to honor the reading of God's Word. So I want to ask you to do that right now. Let's stand as we read from God's Word. Paul writes these words to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 through 10. We do, however, speak a, a wisdom among the mature, but not a wisdom of this age, or of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. On the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery, a wisdom God predestined before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom, because if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human heart has conceived. God has prepared these things for those who love him. Now, God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit, since the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Please exceed it. Anybody who has mastered the ability to read and write, can read God's Word. You don't have to be a Christian to read God's Word. But the non-Christian is not going to understand the message of the Scriptures. Because the Word of God is being taught to us by the Holy Spirit. And as Christians, the Holy Spirit dwells within us, and He is teaching us the Word of God. He is teaching us the mysteries of God. You know, a child who is in the first grade can be told, you know, or taught two plus two equals what? Four. Four. All right, we got some first grade graduates here. Okay, good. But in Christianity, the more you grow in Christ, 
the more you're going to understand the mysteries of God. Just as that child who understands 2 plus 2 equals 4 is not yet ready for calculus or trigonometry because they haven't mastered more fundamentals of math, so you and I must grow in our faith in order to reach deep into the Word of God and to study it and to learn from it. And let the Holy Spirit today speak to us as we look at this passage. Now the Corinthian Christians were spiritual babes. We're going to look at that when we get to chapter 3 here in a little while. They lacked an obedience to God. Yes, they were saved. Yes, they were Christians. But they did not know the depths of God. They did not understand the depth of God's word because they were not growing in their faith. If you want to know God intimately, go deep into God's word. Walk faithfully in obedience. Study the word of God. Now, before we get into this passage that deals with the wisdom of God, I want to ask a simple question. What is God's wisdom that Paul here is proclaiming? It's an important question. Because I'm going to give you six truths of the wisdom of God. But I want you to understand what that wisdom is before we start out. In the Old Testament, it's hidden. I'll talk about that in a minute. But in Paul's day, up until our day, it has been revealed. What is the wisdom of God? Two things. Number one, the wisdom of God is God's plan of salvation. Before the beginning began, God's plan has always been that Jesus Christ would come into the world, live a perfect life, die on the cross for our sins as an atoning sacrifice, and then rise again on the third day. That has been God's plan from the very beginning. It is God's plan of salvation. Now, if you read the Old Testament carefully, it doesn't spell that out in detail. Therein is that mystery. God hints at it. He gives clues toward it. But it's not until the revelation of Jesus Christ in the early first century that this mystery becomes known. So number one, it's God's plan of salvation. But this mystery that Paul is proclaiming is also how God expects you and I to live. Because we do not come to Jesus Christ in salvation and then go live however we want to, to our own glory, to our own selfishness, to our own desires, and then tell God, we'll see you when we get to heaven. No, my friends, if you are in Christ, God has a plan on how he wants you to live your life. This is the mystery of God as well. So let me share with you six truths about God's wisdom. First of all, God's wisdom is only anticipated by those who are receptive to the teachings of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. God's wisdom is only appreciated by those who are receptive to the teachings of the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. And in verse 6, we do, however, speak a wisdom among the mature. Now that maturity is not talking about men or women that's got gray hair like I do. What it's talking about is men and women, boys and girls, who are maturing in their faith in Jesus Christ. You should have a greater knowledge of God today than you did a year ago, even a month ago. We need to be growing in our faith. Now, Paul preached God's wisdom to everyone, to the Christian and to the non-Christian, to the immature believer and to the mature believer. For you see, it is not Paul's responsibility or even my responsibility to take the word of God deep into your life. It's your responsibility through the teaching of the Holy Spirit. So as you study God's Word, 
Don't depend on me. Don't depend on your Sunday school teacher. Don't depend on somebody else. Depend on the Holy Spirit because it's his job to teach us the mysteries of God. Now, the problem comes when we are not living as mature Christians or when we're not even growing towards maturity. Therein is our problem, my friend, because when we choose sin, the Holy Spirit struggles in His work in our life. How does sin affect our, our uh, the Holy Spirit? Well, think about this. <clears throat> All sin comes out of pride. That's why we do sin, because we're prideful, we're sinful. And our pride blocks the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, a couple weeks back, we looked at division within the church. If you're leading division, if you are participating in division, you are not in tune with the Holy Spirit. If you're living a rebellious life, rebellious towards God, then you are not in tune with God. And he is not going to be able to teach you the deeper things of the faith. <clears throat> If you're seeking the things of this world rather than the things of God, you will not hear the Holy Spirit. If you fail to confess your sins, you fail to repent of those sins, then you will not be hearing from the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that we are to be not only hearers of God's word, but what? Doers of God's word. And it's through the Holy Spirit who leads us, who also teaches us the deeper things of God. The second truth about God's wisdom is that God's wisdom bears no connection to the human wisdom of this age. God's wisdom bears no connection to the human wisdom of this age. In the second half of verse 6, Paul wrote, Not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. This world, my friends, is going to come to an end. There's actually a TV series on how the world might end. Well, I know how it's going to end. Because God's Word tells us in Revelation 22, 21, or verse 1, it says there is a new heaven and a new earth. In other words, God is going to say, enough, done create a new heaven and a new earth, one that has not been touched by sin. So this world is coming to an end. But our God, as you well know, is eternal. God's wisdom did not originate from man. Paul did not think up his, his um, gospel. Paul did not create the wisdom of God. He simply made it known to his hearers. Therefore, we cannot study the philosophies of man, man-made religions, or the wisdom of the intellectuals and arrive at the wisdom of God. Now, there's nothing wrong with studying smart people. Nothing wrong about studying science, math, and other, things, other intellectual pursuits. Okay? But recognize they will not take you to the cross of Jesus Christ. They will not proclaim to you the resurrection of our Savior. We must study God's Word. Number three, the third truth about God's wisdom is that God's wisdom is found only in God. Therefore, it must be revealed by God. Beginning in verse 7, he says, We speak God's hidden wisdom. Paul's message originated with God. If you study the book of Acts carefully, Jesus tells Paul on the road to Damascus, go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And Ananias comes, lays hands on him, and restores his, his sight. Paul stays in uh, Damascus just a couple of weeks. And then he goes down to Jerusalem to meet with the apostles who had followed Jesus to hear from them what their 
what the message of Christ was. And of course, the Peters and the James and the Johns and the Matthews and the, the rest, they received their message from Jesus Christ. And this is the message that Paul proclaims. It is from the Word of God. Now today we have the New Testament. Paul didn't have the New Testament. Of course, he wrote parts of it. But he was preaching and teaching from the Old Testament. And he was teaching God's Word. Now, God's wisdom was hidden prior to Jesus. Think about this. Before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the full revelation of God had not yet come into the world. In other words, the New Testament, the 27 books, had not been written. And so there was a time prior to Jesus when the mystery of God was still that, just that, a mystery. It wasn't made known. It wasn't clear yet. But in Christ, it has been made known. And that message is his death and resurrection. Now, if you study the Old Testament, and I encourage you to do so, there are hints towards Jesus. Read Isaiah 53. Isaiah uh, 9, 6, a lot of other passages hint at the coming of the Messiah. But it's not until Jesus came into the world, born of Mary, that we have the full revelation of God coming into the world. Now, if you read the Old Testament, God's message was to who? Jews or Gentiles? To Jews, that's right. In fact, when Jesus told his, his apostles to go into the cities and proclaim his coming, he tells them, don't go to the Gentiles, because they did not have a message yet. But the Jews understood the Old Testament, so they had the message to build on. But it was after the resurrection that Jesus said to his disciples, go into the entire world. Friends, we know the message of God now revealed. It is our responsibility to take it into the world. Number four, the fourth truth about God's wisdom is that God's wisdom has a built-in, time-delayed mystery component. Let me say that again. God's wisdom has a built-in, time-delayed mystery component. Second half of verse seven says this: a wisdom God predestined before the ages. For our glory. There was a time when the mystery was still in effect. In other words, from the days that Moses began writing the, the Torah, the first five books, up until the completion of the Old Testament, up until the right before Jesus was born, the mystery was still in effect. But now the mystery has been revealed. God has completed his revelation. And it is our responsibility to know it and to carry it out into the world. It is no longer a mystery. Now, we need to understand that we are in the middle of a battle. Remember as children, we watched the cartoons on Saturday mornings and, and an angel would pop up on one shoulder and a demon would pop up on another shoulder. And of course, the angel would say, don't do that. Don't do that. And the demon would say, yeah, go ahead, have fun, do whatever you want. All right? That's not necessarily bad theology. Because you and I are in the middle of a battle. On one side, God is encouraging us to walk in obedience, to live by faith. But at the same time, the demonic world does not want us to be effective for God. The demonic world does not want us to know God. How many times have you said, I'm going to read God's Word today, and just as soon as you sat down and opened up God's Word, you thought of a hundred things you needed to do? That's the demonic world trying to keep you out of God's Word. Now, the ultimate goal of God's mystery is our glory. And don't think of glory in terms of Jesus as he you know, radiated on the, the Mount of Transfiguration. That's not what I'm saying here. The glory that Paul is referring to in the end of verse 7 is that God has revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ so that we can have a, 
a relationship with God and spend eternity with God. If you did not hear the message of Jesus Christ from your, your mom or dad, from your pastor, from your Sunday school teacher, from somebody else, you would be lost in your sins, dead to God, and heading towards an eternity separated from God. But the mystery of God has been revealed to you. Jesus Christ has been demonstrated to you, dying on the cross, rising again, so that you can have a relationship with God and be changed because of that. The fifth truth about God's wisdom is this. God's wisdom cannot be comprehended by human wisdom or power or even wealth. The beginning of verse 8 says this. None of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom. Human wisdom cannot be obtained. Uh, excuse me. Human wisdom cannot obtain God's wisdom. I don't care how smart you are. You and I don't come to the level of God. Don't even get close to it. Human power cannot create God's wisdom. Maybe you have great authority in your business or in some civic club or something, but you do not have the power to, do, to um, create the wisdom of God. Human wealth cannot purchase God's wisdom. Jesus even says it's harder for the, a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. It's not impossible. But when you get wealthy, you tend to be focused on that wealth rather than on God. Your wealth will never be able to purchase the wisdom of God. Six. The sixth truth about God's wisdom is that God's wisdom will be vindicated by the return of our Lord of glory. Verse, the end of verse 8, Paul writes, If they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. God's plan before the beginning began was for Jesus to come into the world, to die on the cross for our sins and rise again. God's plan has always been the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. At no time up in heaven did Jesus or did God ever say, Wow, what do I do now? Hey angels, we gotta change our plans. Something's happened on earth. We're in trouble. Never happened. God's been working his plan from the very beginning. He sent Jesus into the world to die on the cross for our sins. God's plan has always been that Jesus Christ would return. How do we know Christ is going to come back? Well, if you go back into the Old Testament, you read the prophecies of Isaiah, the prophecies of Zechariah, the prophecies of Micah, the prophecies of all of the prophets, you will discover that in Jesus' first advent, he completed every single one of those prophecies regarding the coming of the Messiah. So it is not a stretch for the church to say, Jesus is coming back. Not because it's our message that we have created, absolutely not. But it's Jesus who said, I am, will come again. Therefore, you and I have a message to go out into the entire world. We have to take this message to the lost because we don't know when Christ is coming back. It could be this afternoon. It could be before we even get our food served for this uh, dinner on the ground. On the other hand, it may be 10,000 years before Christ comes back. My point is this. He is coming back. And that puts a time urgency on the message that we need to share with the lost. Friends, if you knew that your loved one, or if your neighbor, his house was on fire, would you go into your own house and write a note, put it in the snail mailbox, and hope it gets delivered to him before the end of the month? No. You'd go to his house and you'd knock on that door and you'd say, Brother, sister, you need to get out because your house is on fire. Yet too many Christians let our neighbor's houses burn down because we do not share the mystery of God's word with them. 
friend, every single one of us with me at the head of the line as individuals in our life that need Jesus Christ. God gives us opportunities to share. We need to take that opportunity God gives us to be obedient to God's work. To share the good news of Jesus Christ. We're destined for an eternity separated from God. Unless somebody goes shares and they respond to, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Friends, God's done everything for us. He's given us salvation full and free. He's given us eternal life through Jesus Christ. He's given us his word completed. He gives us the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Now he's simply asking us to go and share. Will you be obedient? Let me lead us in a word of prayer. And Steve, come and lead us in our invitation. Father, we come into your presence this morning. Thank you for allowing us to, to worship you through an outdoor service. Though we hear cars driving up and down Liberty Road, though it is pretty warm outside, we do know that you are with us here today. I pray, Father, that each one of us, especially myself, that we would catch on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ and tell others about him. Tell others in love, tell others in grace, tell others in mercy, and tell others. Father, let us go forth from this place to be obedient to your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.